So, what exactly is gaslighting? party people in the place to be i go by the name of the bk apologist transmitting all the way live new york is the city brooklyn is the borough what's good what's popping <laughs> happy first day of the week i uh, hope everybody's doing well uh of course uh, if you have not already please share the link tell a friend to tell a friend that's him again and if you like how it goes down at the bk apologist please show your support via the PayPal link that's pinned on top of the chat, or if you'd like to be a monthly supporter of BK, you could become uh, a patron where you get an assortment of teaching supplements to enhance your personal Bible study. And of course, we have the best and the brightest in the chat. Of course, I'm talking about the party people like Wow Wall all the way from down un under. We got Devin Payne, we got Tyler Lott, we got Bodega Lady D New on the check-in. We got my main man MJ Jackson in the building. Of course, we got the original, the original American, Mr. Phil Fox in the building. And I am with my uh cold defendant, uh <laughs> co-conspirator, Mr. Apologist in Detroit. The, uh, that's it's Apple Apologist. In oh man. For you. Oh man, you no. gotta get it right. Get it right. Got it right. Get get it right. <laughs> get it right. So, um, we're here again, and we're gonna talk specifically about this term. But before we do, you know, we have a few comments about the response that that Brady has had for us. Uh, I would yeah. like it to be brief. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but it's um, not I'm going gonna... to be brief. But it'll be brief. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna allow so, Mr. So for, <laughs> I'm gonna give the floor to Mr. Detroit because he's chopping the bit to uh okay. you know yeah so yeah okay so yeah so you know he did the response video and he made a couple of valid points uh one of which being um some of our critique um he addressed in other parts of the book which um at the time, at the time that we did the video, I had not read the whole book. I had read, I started off, I think, with chapter three. I started off with uh, whatever the chapter on evolution was, because when he, he'd been posting stuff on, on social media, that seemed to be at the heart of it. And then I, I it quickly went to the ancient or Eastern chapters, because that's something that, that resonates with me and that I have some experience in. And so I wanted to see what exactly he had to say on that. So anyway, so um, while he... Um, he was correct, at least in the point of me that I hadn't finished. I hadn't finished reading the book at the time that we did the first video. I don't think it made much of a difference in any of the things that I would have said in the video, other than maybe acknowledging that he does uh, talk about some of those things in some of his other chapters. That's one. Two, um, I misspoke his name. I called him Godwin instead of Goodwin. He, I, I put on the video in the comments of the video uh, that I am dyslexic. Like this morning, yesterday, I was with Damon Richardson me and him talking, and I called him Brandon, like Brandon Cleaver, because at the time, that's how my brain works. If I'm thinking about somebody else, I was talking to him about Brandon, and that's why I accidentally called him Brandon. Anyway, I'm dyslexic, for those of you who don't know. My brain does that sometimes. I mispronounce people's names. It, was never, it wasn't intended to be a insult or so, um, and he's aware of that now. He accepted my apology. We, we all good. We all cool with that. Um, I would even say that um, listening to him you know, the more I listen to him, the more I think of I think that this is coming from a genuine place. Like um, I, I I feel like, OK, yeah, he's had some ex he had some experiences and um, with learning about some things and that rattled him and he didn't know how to resolve it or the way that he chose to resolve it was um, to apostatize, to walk away from the Christian faith because he saw these issues as irreconcilable. OK, now to some of my critique from his video, which was, I was trying to have a conversation with him in the comments. It's just, it's too complex or nuanced what I was trying to say. And I didn't think it was going to come across because I was trying to explain to him, like, I think it's, I, I, I accused him of, of being arrogant in, you know, 
thinking that he was qualified to um, to make the decisions that he's making or come to the conclusions that he's coming to. And I wanted to to add a little bit of nuance to that. So so every so onlookers as well as him, if he watches this video, he'll understand what I mean by that. Okay, so we um, we live in we live in a, a society where people overestimate, like this is just a cultural flaw of, of us here in Amer as Americans in the West. We overestimate our ability to, um, to, to, to understand things. I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I might be wrong. I have to look that up in a minute. Anyway, there's, there's a term for it because, you know, sociologists have, have recognized this. This is just something about us Americans. So what I was attempting to say was like, not only do I think that he isn't qualified, I would argue that I don't think that scholars are qualified. Now, again, nuance. What I'm not saying is that no one is qualified to apostatize. And, and, and the reality is people can make whatever decisions they want to make because it's, it's not a totalitarian society. It's a free country and people can make that decision. But I think that that's part of the reason that people, you know, feel like they're qualified to, to make these type of decisions. With a scholar, a scholar goes and he either gets, they, he, that he, she, they, whatever, whatever, whoever they are, they get, a, they get a degree in a very small, concise part of scripture, or they get it on some broad narrative of scripture, but they're not getting it on the whole scope of scripture. And the whole scope of scripture, it, it, it spans over a thousand years. It's multicultural. So it's got Egyptian culture woven in, Babylonian culture woven in, Greco-Roman culture woven in. And so it's got all of these aspects of the, the cultures that the, the, the Jewish people interacted with woven in because that's just how they communicated. That's part of this aspect of polemics that, that we, we've been discussing. And so if, you only, if you're only qualified to speak very definitively on a very small portion or a very broad aspect of scripture, how is it that you're qualified? To me, I, when I say qualified, I mean like, hey, could you go before, uh, if you were to go before a panel of experts to, to speak on this, like would they consider you an expert or would they consider you a novice? And I think for the most part, all Christians to some degree are novice, even though we can have um, a, a broader uh, understanding than others. And that's because, you know, we're really talking about our traditions. You know, we all come from traditions. Some people Eastern, some people are Orthodox, some people are Catholic, some people are Protestants. And then there's a bunch of different branches in all three of those major branches of the church. And those, those different branches, um, you know, they basically streamline what they think is true about scripture. And, and, and I am convinced, I'm convinced that um, Brady Goodwin is struggling to recognize that what he is not actually doing is critiquing the people of scripture, but he's critiquing the, the people, the scholars, the theologians, the people who have, who have given him his tradition. Here, he's critiquing their understanding of what they believe that the people of scripture actually believe. And therefore, a lot of his critiques fall flat because they're not they're they're not essential. They're not genuine Christianity. They're just not. And maybe there is no such thing as a as a genuine, uh, authentic Christian stream in the thing in the sense of the apostles, uh, what the apostles received from Jesus or what the Israelites received from Yahweh. You know, but I don't think that that's I don't think that 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 causes any problems because humans have always struggled with comprehending you know the totality of God. None of us have, from the oldest part of the Old Testament to the to the oldest part of the New Testament. I don't think other than maybe Jesus, anyone in scripture fully comprehended it. We They had enough of the truths of God in order for them to embrace Yahwehism, Christianity, follow God. And the rest of it is just like every other aspect in life. I don't have to figure out, and I, I'm almost done, BK. <laughs> I don't have to figure out all of uh, finance in order for me to invest, you know, I don't have to know every single detail about the, the, the woman Constance that I married in order for me to marry her. Like you don't have to have exhaustive knowledge of anything in order for you to have a, a, a general enough understanding to it to invest in it. That's the point that I'm making here. So when I say that he's unqualified, when I say that I think most people are unqualified, what I'm not saying is that nobody can say, I don't buy this and turn away from it. I'm saying if we were to have an honest assessment of ourselves, we would recognize that, hey, this thing is too vast in scope for me to assess in an effective way. And what I can say is that, hey, I don't get it. I don't get it. But I'm not necessarily qualified to say that it's absolutely false. 
So anyway, that's kind of my nuanced point on the, you know, I, I feel like you're arrogant. It's, it's because I feel like all Americans are arrogant. All of us over, overestimate our capacity for comprehending and, and, and understanding things and judging things. And, and the reality is we're, we're quick to judge things. So yeah, those are, those are some basic critiques. I might have some other comments along the way, but we'll see how things go with, uh, once you, once you kind of start sharing and then we'll see what else uh, comes up. But yeah, that's, those are some of my basic thoughts and I tried to keep them as concise as possible. One last thing I will say is, uh, Brady Goodwin, you seem like a pretty sincere dude. If you ever want to talk, um, I'm open to that. You know, I, you, hopefully you can tell that I'm a fairly decently read guy. You won't necessarily have to teach me in order to, to have a conversation with me. But yeah, you know, to me, I'm 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 curious because I'm like I know of these things and they just don't they just don't seem that you know persuasive or they just don't seem that problematic to me. So if you're interested, uh, my my email is apologistindetroit at gmail.com. Hit me up. We can zoom. We can do whatever. Have a conversation. I think that we would have a a, a very you know good conversation. It won't be argumentative or anything like that. All right, so. The floor is yours, VK. Cool. Thank you so much for that. That was that was that was very well articulated and um, sincere. Uh, for me, so uh, the, uh, in the review that we did, I mentioned that he mentions Heiser, but he doesn't show that he disagreed with his thing, with his point. And I show the same paper, but later on, he does show that he disagrees with Heiser. Right. So we, we both showed that he disagrees with Heiser. So I didn't show that. So, you know, Mia Cooper for that. All right. Uh, but we both, again, like you said, I mean, we we both land the same point. You dis Heiser disagrees with you. So. So nothing changed by that. But you did mention that you disagree. That is true. Right. Uh, you, he also mentioned, you know, the other Asian Near East creations. But again, it is the differences that undercuts your argument, not the similarities, you know, which leads into the whole ex nihilo thing. You know, if you have a dependent clause in Genesis 1-1, it doesn't immedi immediately follow that the pre-existing material was not made by Yahweh. You can't just immediately make that conclusion. And a lot of theologians believe that the term heaven and earth it's just a a, 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 a a slang term for everything. Much similar to how we say the whole kit and caboodle or from the rooter to the tutor. We're not talking about the individual parts. We're using that to, to show totality. So even if it's a dependent clause, it will render it when God created everything. And if God created everything, then the pre-existing matter would, be, would fall under the category of everything. But even if it's not a, a colloquialism or an idiom, it still doesn't automatically follow that the pre-existing material that God used was not made by him. Now, we can say that, though, with these other deities from these other creation accounts. Again, that's why the differences matter, because many of these gods have theogonies. They have origin stories. They, be, they arise from <coughs> pre-existing matter. Therefore, they couldn't create ex nihilo because they are made from matter. And when I shared the scripture of Revelation, I wasn't trying to retrofit anything. That was a separate event where we see God creating without any matter. Because in the vision that John had, he said that the old heaven and earth vanished and no longer existed. Which, by the way, is what? Ex nihilo in reverse? Because we know in science that you can't destroy matter. It, but God did. So that's kind of interesting, too. Um, he brings up the thing about Israel being a young civilization, and it's true. They're young in comparison to the other ancient civilizations, but it falls within the age range of ancient history. So the point still matters there. Okay. Um, what else? What else? Is there anything else? Uh, uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. So, so again... I said he didn't disagree with Heiser. He did. Mia Cooper, right? So, but again, I was focusing on that chapter. So there it is, right? So anything else you want to um, chime in on? Yes, before we I have more to say since we have a little bit more time. And don't worry, I, this won't be that long because I got a Zoom meeting at night. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that he brought up was um, mythohistory. 
And uh, mytho, mytho history is kind of a new-ish term. It's uh, um, I can't remember who coined it. Um, first person I heard talking about it was William Lane Craig. And my mind works like, ooh, that sounds interesting. Let me, let me, go, let me go look into this and find out what mytho history is. But um, mytho history does not mean that something is not literal. It just, um, in a high context world, which we defined in the first video, in a high context world, like every, the primary way that everybody communicates is oral. That's the primary way. Even though there are writings, just like today, we have writings and oral, and our primary method of communicating is, is has become writing. So, you know, that's what we do. We write books, we write blogs, we write articles, we send letters, and we send emails. You know, that's our, that's a, that's a primary way of us communicating, particularly for mass communication, um, uh, you know. So um, in ancient world, mass communication was primarily through oral, through oral. So they might write something down, send it to a town, and there's a town square that comes to, everybody come to for an announcement to be made. The announcement is made, and then everybody talks about it when they're sitting down, talk about it when they're walking, talking about it when they're eating, think like the Shema, right? That's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're memorizing it because it, it, it affects the way that, that they are, they're called to live their lives, right? So with mytho history, what they do is they're speaking, they're using the common cultural idiomatic way of communicating, which encompasses some myth, but um, it's, it's intended to establish the truths. And because their world is different, like when we understand mytho history, we might not be we might not be familiar with their idioms, and therefore we have to we need a PhD scholar to dig deep, look at the surrounding cultures, read a bunch of uh, ancient uh, ancient writings, and then explain to us what these idioms mean, so that when we actually read the one that we care about, we can understand it. Uh, but that doesn't make it any less valid than our way of communicating. And ironically, like we still have. We still have aspects of mytho -histor historic communication in our own. We still use hyperbole. You know, you still see a sports article that says one team killed another team, and we know that nobody died because we're we are fluent in our cultural idioms. So we know what killed mean within that particular context, and we know the difference between that story and a story on the front page of the news about you know some uh, unfortunate incident that has happened. We have. Um, if, if, if you recall, it's not as common today, but early on, particular in colonial America, they had what's called tall tales, where they would do, do a similar thing. This is similarly at a time where writing is kind of on the rise and as a form of mass communication, but oral communication is still this very familiar thing. So, you know, what they would do is they would take a story like of a, a guy named John Henry that was really proficient at laying railroad tracks, and they would elaborate it. And they would they would add um, elements of myth to it. You know, he laid in a bunch of tracks faster than, than this machine, this steam machine or that anybody else could do over this short period of time. So uh, and, and even more familiar to someone like you, uh, Mr. Brady Goodwin, is rap music. Rap music is filled with people calling themselves gods and talking about um, what they would do to other people and using all different types of analogies to, to, to make, a, to tell a story about whatever they're talking about. So this is like mytho history is not some, it does not mean that what's being stated is not true. It's just being stated, it's just being stated in kind of a colloquial, um, hyperbolic, and in, in a more elaborate way than a more direct you know, way of saying something. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that it's mytho. Don't mistake the myth aspect of mytho history to assume that it's not true. It's just a way of, of communicating with exaggeration. Another thing that uh, he uh, mentioned, he kept mentioning uh, like uh, uh, tradition. He would say, but that's your tradition, you know, Mr. Apologist in Detroit, that's, that's your tradition. And he seemed to grasp fairly well the concept of tradition. You know, but he just doesn't seem to accept the fact that his tradition <clears throat> was a tradition and not authentic to Christianity. And the reason I think I feel confident in saying that is because he said he would rather he didn't think that it was authentic to change his view to what he would classify as a more liberal view 
then and, 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 and update his tradition. Like he, he brought up William Lane Craig and how William Lane Craig was dealing with this evolution issue. And it's like, yes, but William Lane Craig didn't apostatize. You know what he did? He updated his tradition. And that's because likely because William Lane Craig has a, a lot of knowledge from his years, accumulated years of studying the scriptures in a different tradition that was not, I would argue, as dogmatic as probably the tradition that Brady Goodwin grew up in. And um, and because of that, you know, William Lane Craig feels comfortable, just like I feel comfortable. Just when I get this with divine counsel, just updating my tradition with what I understand of scripture, because it doesn't fundamentally undermine anything that I already believe. It just doesn't. It doesn't undermine it. So why would I have an issue with updating it when I recognize that a lot of what I the vast majority of what I believe is tradition? So uh, I think I might have one or two more points. And uh, it says, and um, but you will say none of these traditions impact the core of the gospel. How do you know that? Okay, so yeah, that's the last. That's one of the last things he said in the video, and that's going to be the last thing that I got to comment on, and then we can get out of here. Keep this video real short. Um, how do I know? Okay, because I've because I actually read the Bible. You know, that's the short version of the story. And uh, and yes, that's with me fully understanding that an English translation of the Bible is not nearly as um, impactful as a Hebrew, Aramaic, and a Greek uh, a translation of the Bible, um, let alone being more fluent in those cultures to understand a lot of what's being implied uh, that's uh, that's unsaid uh, in, in, in those ancient writings. But that said, like when I actually read the Bible, what I see is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament in, in, in the message that is communicating in spite of all of these differences. The main message is that God wants to save people. That's the, that's the basic message of scripture. And in spite of all of the complexities and stories in which this message comes through, it seems to shine through fairly clearly. You know, God, um, God uh, partners with humanity with, with, uh, with uh, a priestly coupling of, a, of Adam and Eve, woman and man in a, in, a, in a garden, which is a temple in the ancient world. And he, he, he gives them this in this temple that has fruit trees, that has water, has Gold and onyx has all the necessities of a flourishing life. He gives, he places them in this gardener, garden, partners with them, and he's using them to teach humanity how to how to know Yahweh and uh, their God, and how to live the good life that Yahweh has prescribed for them, the flourishing life. Adam and Eve rebel. They decide, hey, I know better. I know good. I'm smart. I can do this on my own. I don't need you, God, to tell me how to teach fellow humanity how to flourish. I can figure it out of my own. And that's called the fall. And what? And instead of teaching to how to do righteousness, they teach how to do evil, sin. And so all of men spiral out of control, being passing down sinful ways further and further down from this line. And then eventually God elects a new priestly line. His name is, is uh, Noah. And then eventually another one, his name is Abraham and his descendants. And then eventually... Uh, he he comes and does it himself. Like uh, he comes and does it himself. Hey, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to teach these people how to flourish. And, and that's the basic story. God is saving people. That's the basic story of the Bible. Now we, different traditions are going to differ on certain elements and aspects of this basic story about a God wanting to save humanity. So the way we might see original sin, the way that we, we might see um, the fall, there's different elements that our traditions are, are going to. And yeah, we, we, we got it bad, man. We're very imperialistic. We're very much going to go, you guys are heretics. That's, that's what Christians do, sadly, because in John 17, Jesus prayed that we be united. That's another, that's another story. So at the end of the day, God's a God, Abraham, um, asked God when God was talking about destroying, uh, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, shall not the creator of the universe do what is just? And if you read the rest of the scope of scripture, that's how God describes himself. He's the God of justice and righteousness. Go read the Psalms. If you read the, that's how, if you, if you follow the, the, the Israelites understanding of God, that's how they see him. He is the God of justice and righteousness. Read like Psalm 72, right? Um, you get to the New Testament and it's the same thing. It's this God that wants to save humanity. That's the basic story of scripture. So, and, and, and if, uh, I, I mentioned this at the end of the last video. Like all these other competing narratives about their um, their their regional gods, 
um, all these other uh, Elohim, all these other regional people who are comparing and contrasting and polemicizing with the Israelite people. Um, guess what? <laughs> we don't, no one recognizes those gods anymore. Everyone looks back at those gods and sees those gods as, uh, as, as myth, uh, or as, as Yahweh would often say to the Israelites, like, hey, look, you build a fire with this wood and you cook your food with this wood and then you turn it into an image and worship it. That don't make no sense. That's what Yahweh said. So, yeah. So, you know, this is this is the story. This is the basic story of scripture. There's a God. He wants to save people. That God has been around back then. He's here today. All the competing gods back then are gone. There's new gods on the scene trying to compete with him. But the reality is he, he's the God that's actually here saving people. And we know that from logic, you know, some of the arguments that you might reject in your book, like the, um, you know, the, the, the this argument from teleological, the argument, the argument from design, the ontological, all these arguments that you might actually reject, okay, are, are compelling enough for many to accept. Many of people have had experiences, whether that be a dream or some other experience. And as far be it from me, or you to discount what other people said. Hey, you can factor it in to whatever degree that you weighed it, but I don't think it's fair for you just to be dismissive of it just because you didn't experience it. That's This goes back to my argument about us being arrogant. That's what we do. We think our experience qualifies us to be the arbiter of truth for all other people and set the standard, and we're imperialistic. So I would say Mr. Brady Goodwin, again, if you want to have a conversation, I'd love to. I, I think that it would be a very stimulating conversation. Um, I, I think that um, while I respect the fact that you have um, decided to that that you believe what you believe and you think that these things are myths and uh, you don't think that the people of Scripture can give us ontological truths, which is a whole nother rant that I'm not going to go on. I'm not going to belabor us with right now, but doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I'm like, hey, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with you. I, my my prayer and my hope is that you recognize that just at least on a logical level that. You know, hey, we need to we need to we need to be more gracious. You you complain about other Christians not being gracious, rightfully so, by the way, rightfully so. You complain about when Christians aren't gracious, and uh, but I think that to a degree, in, in some ways, you aren't being very gracious, uh, and, and I think that you're overestimating your ability to judge things that are way more vast in scope than than uh, than possible for us to kind of judge in a way that you're judging. So uh, again. BK uh, and I, we both apologize for where we got it wrong. We stand firmly and confidently on the things that we said that we disagree with you on, and, and we feel very confident that uh, we got it right. The differences does matter, and and um and in the chapter that we critique, um we just disagree with you on that. We think that you got it, we got it wrong. We think the differences matter, and um yeah. Again, if you're interested in having a conversation, you know, hit me up apologies in Detroit at gmail.com. I'm certainly open to that. And uh, BK, I'm turning the floor back over to you for uh, for you to, you know, close us out. And uh, if if you have any final comments or anything. Well, I, I with with this, um, I would like to get into um, the subject of the actual term that he uses for the title of his book, and that term is gaslighting. So let's look at the origin of where we even get this term from. All right, so. All right, so Gaslight is a 1944 American psychological thriller directed by George Cukor and starring Charles Boyer, Ingrid Bergman, Joseph Cotton, Angela Lansbury in her film debut, adopted by John Van Druten, Walter Rice, and John L. Bolton from Patrick Hamilton's play Gaslight, 1938. The term gaslighting comes from the movie Gaslight, in which Gregory deliberately tries to make his spouse Paula lose her mind by manipulating her, her friends, and her physical environment. Gregory's aim is to have Paula hospitalized for mental instability so he can gain access to her jewels. We witness him engaging in one crazy making manipulative move after another. Over a stretch of months, he takes a brooch he claimed to be a prized heirloom out of Paula's purse to make her doubt her clear memory of having it put it there. He places his own watch in her purse when she's not looking, accuses her of stealing it, and then, quote, discovers the watch in her purse while she is in the company of friends who, unbeknownst to Paula, 
he's warned that Paula is unstable. This last incident not only upsets and confuses Paula, but is constructed by Gregory to be public so as to, prov to provide her friends with apparent, quote, evidence that she's losing her mind. It's also thereby contributes to Paula's increasing sense of isolation. The title of the movie is drawn from the following manipulative move. Gregory regularly searches for Paula's jewels in the attic. And when he does so, his turning on the lights there has the effect of dimming the gas lights elsewhere in the house. Every time this happens, Paula queries him about the gas lights dimming. And each time, Gregory insists Paula is imagining things, suggesting that this too is a sign of growing mental illness. All the while, Gregory is full of expressions of purported concern. Why don't you rest for a while? Do you really want to go out? You know you haven't been well, etc. All right, so this is the, the, the film and the premise which we get this term from. In Merriam-Webster, right, the definition of gaslighting is psychological manipulation of a person usually over an extended period of time that causes the victim to question the validity of their own thoughts, perception of reality, or memories, and typically leads to confusion, loss of confidence, and self-esteem, uncertainty of one's emotional or mental stability, and a dependency on the perpetrator. Gaslighting could be a very effective tool for the abuser to control an individual. It's done slowly, so the victim writes off the event as a one-off or oddity that doesn't realize they are being controlled and manipulated. This is a classic gaslighting technique, telling friends that others are crazy and lying, and that the gaslighter is the only source for, quote, truth, information. It makes victims question their reality. Okay. Uh, this is from the book called Gaslighting by Stephanie Circus, PhD. Uh, she says, What does gaslighting really mean? And where did it come from? The term gaslight as a kind of psychological manipulation was first added to the Oxford English Dictionary in December 2004, although the documented use of this word and its variants goes back to 1952. In fact, the term seems to have been coined by Patrick Hamilton in his 1938 play Gaslight and first made popular by the 1944 movie Gaslight directed by George Cukor, its starring Ingrid Bergman and Charles Boyer. Gregory Paul's husband tries to convince her that she is going crazy, losing objects precious to her, hearing and seeing things that aren't there, thinking the lights are flickering when he claims they are not. It turns out it has all been a setup to, quote, gaslight her. I'll leave the rest for you to discover if you haven't seen the film. Gaslighters use their own words against you, plot against you, lie to your face, deny your needs, show excessive displays of power, try to convince you of, quote, alternative facts, turn family and friends against you, all with the goal of watching you suffer, consolidating their power and increasing their dependence on them. Okay, there's a PhD really unpack, unpacking this term, okay, and, and what it, it, it includes. Gaslighting shares characteristics of other personality disorders. Some people who gaslight meet the American Psychiatric Association's DM, DMS criteria for the following disorders, known in the manual as Cluster B, personality disorders. You have hysteronic personality disorder, narcissistic, disorder, antisocial disorder, and borderline personality disorder. All cluster B personality disorders are characterized by impulsivity. P personality disorders are taught to be deeply ingrained in a person's behavior, making the individual very difficult to treat. People with personality disorders also experience being egocentric. They believe everyone else is crazy or has a problem, not them. Why is this important? Why am I going through this lengthy definition? It's so that we can understand what the term means. So now that we understand the definition, uh, apologies, can you read this passage from Brady's book here? 
Due to the ever increasing list of cultural, literary, and linguistic considerations, on top of the imaginative suppositions many pastors and theologians offer as answers to the challenges facing the Bible from current science and common sense, it becomes difficult to take them seriously. One cannot escape the sense that we are being gaslighted by God's representatives. They maintain that the problem is not with the text, it is with us in our modern Western logical uh, linear minds placing demands on the scriptures that they were never intended to meet. Right. So we, you know, we try to explain scripture through the, the original context. But I don't know anyone in the UA that would recommend to anyone when we're trying to break down scripture that they should just throw away their logic. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we talk about, you know, not seeing the, the scripture with modern eyes, with a Western view. You know, you want to look at it from the perspective of the author and the original audience. But no one has, has ever said, you know what? Don't be logical right now. Like that's not something that we would we would um, teach. And I'll get back to, to the word in a minute, but in um, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, A Guide to Understanding the Bible, page 22, says the first task of an interpreter is called exegesis. Exegesis is the careful, systematic study of the scripture to discover the original intended meaning. This is basically a historical task. It is the attempt to hear the word as the original re recipients were to have heard it to find out what was the original intent of the words of the Bible. That's what we try to do. But it's not only Christians, it's historians. You know, when they look at a historical document, they need to put their modern viewpoints and make sure they don't smuggle that into the text so they can understand it from the perspective of the author and the original audience. So this is not just for Christians. This is just how you do history, right? Now, back to his quote. So he says, one cannot escape the sense that we are being gaslighted by God's representatives, right? Now that goes for the pastors and ministers, bishops, but that goes for us as well. All of us who, who have made Jesus Lord, who are actively sharing the gospel of other people. He's saying that we are we are gaslighting people. And the reason why it's important to understand the definition, because I want us to understand what he's saying about us. He's saying that those who represent God are psychological abusers. That we have no problem lying. And that we have the intent to disable other people's mental health. This is what he's saying when he uses the term. Now, before I, in the previous video, I said I wasn't going to be uh, gracious or, or give leeway. I want to here because I really want to believe that's not what he really meant. Right? Maybe he means unbeknownst to us, even though we have the purest of hearts, we somehow are doing this because one can be sincere and be wrong at the same time. Maybe that's what he means, but I don't see any caveats or conditions here, you know, and, and if he likes to um, give us uh, some caveats behind it, that'd be great. I would still disagree, but it definitely would change the temperature of the situation because this is a heavy accusation to throw at a bunch of people that you don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, as Dana um, said earlier, let me see if I can find her. What she said, oh, man. Where, where is where? Is yeah, why are you looking for that? Yeah, I, you know, my my suspicion was that his primary, uh, his primary accusation of gaslighting was uh, in light of the fact that as he was in seminary and as he was having discussions with um, uh, scholars uh, on his journey to apostatizing, that he felt like they were ignoring my suspicion again he's he'd have to tell us he felt like they were ignoring obvious contradictions or conflicts of interest and therefore he felt like to maintain christianity in light of these realities 
that they ha- they're gaslighting because they know it's false and they're still uh, they're still pushing it. Where it is right. again, my contention is that no, I think that you're overestimating your own ability to assess these things, and you're putting yourself in the seat of Lord and 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 telling all of us that we got it wrong. And I think that he the problem is in him and not in them. So anyway, right. just my speculation. But it, it's more. It's more than just saying we're wrong because Danny here makes a point. A component of gaslighting is intentional deception. Exactly. Yeah. So if you guys watch, have been watching me, you know, I've had people call me a bunch of things, very colorful things. I've been known, I've been told that I dance for butter biscuits for my Jesuit overlord, Vocat Malone. I've been told that I smoke synthetic weed. Right. Uh, people have said that, you know, I, I eat pork chops, but I've been plant based for like four years. Right. And people say the craziest stuff about me. And a lot of it's funny. And I laugh with you, you know. But the, the one thing I don't laugh is when you say that I didn't say something that I didn't do or say. Yeah, MJ. Right. Right. Fried chicken. They said I'm eating fried chicken. Well, they said pork chops too, but that's another story. That's yeah, yeah, meat in general, right? But his, I have an issue when someone says I did or said something that I didn't do or say. And this is a scathing accusation. You're saying that I am a psychological abuser. You're saying that all of us, me, Chris, the people in the chat, anybody who tries to be an ambassador for Christ, a representative. Is a psychological abuser. That that's my intent. That I am trying to cause people to go insane. That's what the term is. I mean, let's 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 go back. Look, look. Right? Um gaslighters, use your own words against you, plot against you, lie to your face, deny your needs. Show excessive displays of power. Try to convince you of alternative facts. Turn family and friends against you, all with the goal of watching you suffer, consolidating their power and increasing your dependence on them. Is that what you think we're doing? How do you know that that's my intent? You know what I mean? It's like, how do you know? How do you know that's any of our intent? You don't know me. You don't know Chris. You know, if you want to say we're wrong or, you know, we're incorrect, we don't know what we're talking about, that's fine. But to go as far as to say that we are, our intent is to destabilize people's mental ability. That's like, how can you say that about us? So I, it's, 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 I think it's hypocritical for you to feign offense when you come out the gate saying that we're psychological abusers. And, and here's, here's the thing. You're old enough not to do that. And what do I mean by that? You didn't grow up with the internet. You didn't. And you're an MC. So you've been in certain circles and certain environments that, you know, if you say certain things, you better show and prove or there will be immediate consequences. Right? Because a lot of people on the internet are purposely toxic because they feel safe to say whatever they want to say behind their keyboards. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, and, and this is not okay. I'm going to say this. This is not to 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 dig. This is just a like reflective moment, like that Georgetta Car- Carvin's uh, comment. Like the last two years, while he's been kind of wrestling with this in the backdrop, he's and he's presented himself in the public or to some degree, I imagine in the public, I don't know him, I don't know his circle as he was still being Christian or for whatever period of time that he did that. I mean, that's more akin to gaslighting than actually the the t- average Christian or even the average Christian theologian who don't necessarily see the the the, the challenges uh, in, of interpretation as, pro- as problematically as he does. So yeah, I, th- that was just that just kind of popped out to me. Um, I also thought of an analogy, if if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. If you took a person from anywhere in the ancient world, and 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 you you gave them the ability to comprehend language, so that's not a barrier, right? 
but you were and you transported them from anywhere in the ancient world to today. I mean, imagine what life, what their experience would be. Like virtually everything would seem like magic to them. You know, mass transportation of any form, a bicycle, a car, you know, an airplane. It's incomprehensible to be able to traverse the amount of space that we can today due to the advancement of technology. But we recognize that as, as technology and it's just woven into the fabric of our everyday life the way we don't even think about it. We just think I got to get on the bus. We think we don't even think about the complexity of an of a of a, a combustion engine, let alone an electric motor now that we've getting all these electric cars and such. Right. right? Um <clears throat> uh, the way that we can um genetically modify food to mass produce it to where there's no there's no famines. Have you ever noticed that? There's no famines. You read about all these famines in the Bible now here there's no famines. It's because of GMO. It's because of growth hormones with 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 our cattle uh, that we, we we produce bigger, more robust crops and animals so that we never run out of food. As a matter of fact, here in America, we throw out more food than some countries consume in, in an entire year because we're such we have almost half a billion people here in America. And we have this big eat out culture that we don't eat all the food. We take it home and throw it out. So it's like we don't like if, if you transported a person from the ancient world of, at any time to today and the language barrier was not a barrier it would they it would they would struggle to believe the stuff that we're telling them or if you transported us back to their time they would think that we're crazy they would think that we're the we're the wackos because we're telling them how easy life is in our time when in their time these things are incomprehensible likewise when we get transported back into their time by reading their literature some things are incomprehensible to us. We can't even begin to fathom and imagine some of the things that they have experienced that they are testifying to us because our experience just so happens to be different. So again, this this notion this when I'm arguing that it, it's arrogant, it's arrogant of us to try to superimpose our modern sensibilities, uh cultural uh, social mores, cultural standards, our way of thinking and our way of understanding the world, it's its wrong for us to just impose that on them. We have to transport ourselves to their time and do our best to understand the world the way that they understand stood the world and in order for us to grasp whatever truth that they were attempting to communicate to us. That's just the reality. And, 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 and again, I just think it's, I just, you know, I, I really want to, I really want him to introspect, to reflect on this. I really want him to have a more balanced and sobering um, respect for the, 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 the gravity of the vastness of data, of information that you're trying, that, that you have claimed that you understand so well that you can make a definitive judgment the way that you have. And not only that, you, you your judgment is so convincing that you think that those who disagree with you, at least some of them, are gaslighting people, are psychologically, psychologically manipulating people and exploiting people and try and, and making people making people unstable. That just, you know, it just that seems like a like as BK was saying. That just seems like a a, a very that seems like a very uh, you know that seems like an overreaction. That's way too way too much of a of a um that's way too much of a of a of a of an accusation. Gaslighting one and then two. I just think that you know I just don't think that anybody's qualified to really you know, judge with in, with any definitive. You can just say, hey, I've seen enough and I'm not interested and I want to move on. That's one thing. I'm not interested anymore or I'm more of a skeptic than a believer. That's one thing. For you to just say that none of this is real. None of this is real. And all of this, it, to me, I just feel like that's your modern sensibilities getting the best of you. And, and you need to reel that back in. If you want to, if you want to continue to be ad admired or respected for your intellectual prowess, you have to have a more sobering and mature and responsible uh, awareness of, of how, of what you're engaging engaging in. Because while it might be accept, acceptable on a very popular level to speak your mind and be your real you and all that other stuff, you know, on, a, on an intellectual level, I think that, you know, people who are really critically assessing these things and engaging on these things, they'll turn away from you because they'll be like, oh, oh, you've, 
you, you, you're not really serious about it or you, you're, you have this blind spot that, that uh, is getting the best of you. And it also shows a, a lack of compassion because I believe that you think by saying these things, I guess it's trying to help us, but it's hard to have dialogue with someone when they begin with, hey, you're a psychological abuser. Now, granted, truth is truth regardless of how it's being presented, right? But at the end of the day, we're human beings. It's hard for me to hear another human try to tell me something when they begin with insulting me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard. You can still be right. You can still be right. But I can't hear you if you're starting off with you're an abuser. So with that, you know, I, I just just be more mindful next time of your critiques. Critique away. Disagree as much as you want. But critiquing and then accusing people of what that that you don't know of of certain things that you never seen them do, that's that goes beyond mere let me show you where you're wrong. So in the future, it'd be great if you don't go and 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 listen. Maybe they know the whole definition. You read the, you saw the title, you thought of it. It's a bar, right? It's catchy. It's a little spicy, right? I get that. Okay, but I don't know if you understand how how to be honest, how disrespectful that is to a bunch of people that you don't know. So if you could just be more mindful. We would greatly appreciate it, and 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 we can continue having or or well start a dialogue if you would like, and we, you know, and and we won't go into the mud and sling stuff at each other and just have an actual dialogue to see if we could come to some sort of conclusion. All right. So, with that being said, uh, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, I'm gonna give apologies the final word, and we're gonna be out of here. So I just want to reiterate, you know, the apology for the miscues, the reaffirmation of the convictions and um, and and uh, re uh, and into and, and into uh, having a, a brain fog at the moment. But yeah, but just just reextend this um, notion of, hey, like, listen, if you ever want to talk, you know, I'm more than interested. It'll be a very gracious dialogue in uh It'll be a very gracious and respectful dialogue, as I think it would be with BK if you're interested in talking to him either. So thanks, yeah, everybody, I, for coming in tonight. Go yeah. There's no hatred here, man. There's no hatred. I, I dislike what you said and what you called me. That's not cool. <laughs> but you know what? We, we could get past that. We could actually get past that. If, if you stop calling people that, <laughs> we could get past it. All right? So with that being said, man, uh, Dr. Detroit and BK signing off. Peace.